Okay, so look, these are our racks. We're very lucky, they're very, very well stocked. Um, it's for a couple of reasons. We're not just working on completely electronic music, we're also dealing with some live stuff as well. Um, and this kind of reflects all of that. So let's look at the left one first. We've got some great effects, got a TC Electronic um, 2000, um, a br the Eventide's Brilliant Eclipse, a beautiful old Lexicon 300. Um, if you're looking for a great reverb and you're just not getting the depth you need out of the plug-in stuff, do look these up. They're absolutely phenomenal. They've got great um, digital connections on the back as well. Um, Curve Bender and the Limiter, these came up uh, kind of randomly and we got them at an exceptionally good price at the point, just couldn't say no. And we've got another project called Pegasus which is using a kind of hybrid of um, acoustic and electronic stuff, so these really, really work well for that. Our favourite in this rack is this thing from uh, the guys in uh, Ukraine called HCL, Half Handcrafted Labs, and it's hilarious. Uh, it's basically, you can't even see, but the, the two LED lights in the back are completely separate, are completely different colours. The, the, the back paper's faded on one of them and starting to bulge a little bit with a bit of damp, but it is literally one of the best sounding compressors I've ever heard in my life. Um, when we're recording vocals, we use the right-hand side here. It works a little bit like an LA-2A, but you've got a ratio control on there. So basically just straightforward peak reduction and gain. You've got a, uh, an adjuster between soft and hard knee, but it just sounds like nothing else. And if you go onto their website, they uh, talk about their shady past, which is basically, uh, I think, being military radio operators in Ukraine, which means they have an absolutely phenomenal knowledge of valve circuitry and military valve circuitry by the looks of things. So I think there are probably valves in this that used to uh, transfer all sorts of communiques between various uh, bits of Russian hardware, which I love the idea of. They do a fantastic thing called a Varies as well, which at one stage I will uh, try and get hold of, but we've just not really got the budget at the moment. Got an old Akai XS6000 in there, which we managed to pick up for 200 quid. It's absolutely brilliant. There's so much library of this stuff around, and I come from the old hardware day, so I've got an enormous library too. It's great fun to kind of have up. Uh, Roland Dimension D down there, always good for proper modulation. Um, at the top, one really interesting little thing, these little Neumann EQs. Now, Neumann um, are known for microphones and for cutting lathes, but within kind of doing record cutting, things like that, they also made a few little mastering EQs. These things sound fantastic on top of your mix or on individual elements. Um, the box uh, is certainly not my design, it's a, um, but it's an old Telefunken power supply, so that's really handy, and a beautiful uh, PMV70 preamp, which is great for mono synths and stuff. Um, this thing is one of our favorite preamps. Uh, we're very lucky to have it. It's a Neve 57. And if you haven't heard of a Neve 57, it's because very few people have. It's a particularly weird bespoke, well not bespoke, it's an early Neve. Um, and it's when Neve was still made using germanium transistors. So it's renowned in rock circles apparently for being great on guitars and that kind of thing. But for modern synths obviously, where we're looking for the same kind of power, it can really add some bite. Um, but it's not subtle. It's not subtle like the old and the, the later Neves were, um, but it's still rock solid. Look, this was probably made in the 60s at some point and it's still working perfectly. Um, Neve 3 Series underneath, beautiful. It's our main preamp, especially if we've got anything live in or doing vocals. My much loved SSL rack. We've got the stereo EQ, stereo dynamics module, a couple of mono EQs, the brilliant um, uh, pre's that have got the, uh, the VHD, the sort of variable harmonic distortion that you can either make valvey or um, solid state sounding thing, stereo compressor. Underneath is one of our favourite things that we have here. Uh, it's made by uh, a chap who was local to Brighton, now he's moved up to London. Uh, it's the Brain Audio Systems LIFE1, or LIFE1, and it's just a mental compressor. It's based on a similar design to an SSL, but it's the most hard-hitting thing that we've ever come across, and a brilliant drum compressor that we're using all the time. Um, I quickly can show you what it does. So if I just run, this is the Peg one of the Pegasus tracks we were working on. It's actually been released, but this is one of the mixed files. Uh, so that's it. It's a typical digital mix. Nothing's quite gluing together. Um, let me just bung this in into play and you can hear the difference. show you the power of the thing, let me really go to town on this so you can hear some of the grab that it's got. Now that's quite severe as it is. Auto release functions. It can really grab. So we're kind of completely overdoing it here, but once you... 
just relax it a little. Before. After. Once again, before. After. Uh, it's got a great side chain function. We're not quite sure exactly what it does, but all I know is if we put it onto about 300 or 150, depending on the track, and wind some of the, um, the high pass filter level up to it, all of the bass kind of comes forward in a way that not many SSL compressor clones do. A lot of them tend to be very grabby and kind of lose some of the bass information. But as you can hear from that, you really get a lot of transients through. Uh, Neve Summing Mixer, our 500 rack with one of our main recording compressors in there, the 527s. These brilliant boxes from Radial that allow you to go in and out of guitar pedals um, with a mix control. Very, very useful. So if you can get your old overdrive pedals out and face pedals and things like that and interface it perfectly with a normal system. Um, EMs, um, the EM preamps, absolutely stunning things. Uh, these are the golds. Chandler EQs, which we've had for a good while now. And every time you need, you've got anything that's um, analog source, say, or real recording, acoustic guitar, for example, needs a little bit of life. They're the first things we go for. The brilliant Elysia Expressor 500s. Um, one thing I would say quickly, a little tip, if any of you have got a 500 series rack and it's starting to, your stuff doesn't sound quite right going through it, watch your levels. These things only have a 16 volt power supply. Um, so in other words, there's not a great deal of headroom inside them. So if you've got a thing in your computer that's digital full scale and you're going out of an LD interface into one of these and it's literally going up there, you are probably pushing plus 18 dB into some of these things and they just won't handle it. So drop the level before it goes in and then boost it back out as you get it in and these things will all start to sing. Um, Valley People 610 compressor. It's uh, a lot of people know of the dynamite. We've got two in here. They were brilliant in the 80s on drums and that kind of thing. And this was their kind of flagship at the time. It's an absolutely monstrous sounding thing for drum loops. Um, and as I say, our other, our other project Pegasus uses that an awful lot. Our Thermionic Culture Rooster preamp. Um, just wonderful thing to be sticking synths through and gain a little bit of bass lift and some, um, some throaty uh, mid-range and top. Um, an old Alesis 3630, I believe that we needed for one particular project, so it's always stayed in the rack. And this was the best purchase we've ever made in the studio, in my opinion. It's the Apogee Symphony IO. Um, it's, when it came in, it solved a lot of, awful lot of our sinking problems, and it's been a kind of real set it in there and forget it. Um, we had prisons before that were absolutely wonderful, but we were having problems with um, firewire drivers, uh, so when we switched over to that, our computer just seemed to interface with it perfectly, so we've never really looked further. Um, slightly dodgy patch bay, but hey, it uh, all works. Um, over here, one of our mainstays of drum programming, we do use a mixture of machine and MPC, but the one thing that we found with this um, is the vintage modes on it. When you start to put things into it, it just sounds like I always remember an MPC sounding. In other words, it cuts through. It's almost like the, the mini Moog of a drum machine. When you've got your sounds and your loops particularly coming through um, an MP MPC, uh, they just seem to clatter away and, and, and fit beautifully. Um, underneath this, this is a rack of Cowrec vintage EQs that came out of a studio that was closing down, unfortunately. We were ever so lucky to get hold of it. It did need a bit of work. Um, and then our friend Paul at a company called Never Finished um, got hold of it and redid all of the caps and they're all sat out there and he's done an absolutely stunning job on this and also recalibrated the entire thing so that it can withstand high levels coming out. So in other words, I can send almost at digital full scale and this thing will not clip and then you've got the beautiful sounds of these EQs. Um, would love to show you but it will take ages to kind of set it up and do it but they absolutely sing. It's a, a beautiful thing to have. Calrex, historically, uh, replaced Neve at the BBC for all, all of the broadcast desks, so it's that level of quality. Uh, going across, we've got a Manly Massive Passive, which is actually off today, but it's used an awful lot. It took me an awful lot of time to really dig into that EQ until I found some of the wonderful things, like you can just pretty much grab it, uh, go for a low shelf on that low mid band, and then a high shelf on that high band. They've got crossing over frequencies almost, so you can pretty much dig in from, say, 820 to about okay there and just literally it's almost like a great big smile curve that's just on two bands and then you've got full control on each it really does live up to its name the super pull tech um, it's a wonderful thing 
And now we've got something here that someone would have to prize out of my dying hands. It would be the, the last thing I would ever let go in the studio. It's the uh, GML uh, 8900 Dynamic Gain Controller, which is... Um, George Massenberg really didn't want it to be called a compressor, and it was Steve Mack who got me onto this. Um, and he said it was one of the finest compressors that he ever used. One came up just at the right price, just when we were doing some stuff that was delicate and needed a bit of work. And this has, that's why it's got a centre position there. It's an absolutely stunning piece of equipment. Um, I won't show you now, but just to say, when you put this on anything that's uh, got musical content that you're trying to bring the emotion out of, it just seems to literally pull it out. Vocals, piano, strings, all of that kind of thing. Equally brilliant on drum loops, um, disco loops, or anything that you've sampled um, um, but and it, oddly it was always designed never to be a particularly uh, modern sounding thing it was for more a, a, a traditional recording but in today's kind of heavy electronic world it really really still does sound fantastic cut audio fatso always great fun especially it's there because it's a great solution if you're recording quickly and you've got a problem with anything um, gml eq and our most important um, things in the studio the speakers um, event Opals that we've never changed and a Genelec 8040s. This is our kind of uh, special corner. It was almost, these were really bought as almost investments because we got them just at the right price, just at the time that we were going up. So we've got an almost museum grade uh, Jupiter 8 here, which I've got to say thank you for Dan at GAC for kind of uh, sorting out for us because he did a, an excellent job of uh, semi restoring it and bringing it back. It's one of the only ones I've seen that hasn't been massively overplayed. So um, the screws don't have an awful lot of um, tarnish on them or uh, rust wear. Um, beautiful sounding thing. And the great thing is when you actually sniff the back of it, it sounds, it smells like old computer chips, which is one of the most bizarre things. Remembering back to your, well, particularly my, my youth of things like Commodore 64s, it just smells uh, of that era. I love it because it was the first synth I ever touched at the age of 16. There was a thing um, at the local college where they were trying to get people into further education. Well, I wasn't interested in that. I saw this on the stage of the theatre where a band are going to play later on, and I spent the entire day twiddling with it and just mucking about with all this, making stupid helicopter noises. And apparently the guy who owned it went absolutely mental when he'd, uh, when he'd come to play the gig later on and everything was in a complete state because um, it obviously was set up for the way he wanted to, uh, to be performing later on. And underneath, we've got one of the rarest hardware synths um, that we've ever come across. It's the Hartman Neuron. Um, very few were made, unfortunately. It was a kind of semi bit of a disaster, but an incredible sounding thing. It had concretely groundbreaking synthesis techniques um, for its time. It's effectively got two, I forgot what they're actually called, the, um, oh, the resonators with, uh, no, not with a Z, but uh, some weird spelling anyway. These wonderful little joysticks, and we won't go into too much of the, um, the kind of ins and outs of what it does, but let's just say that it sounds absolutely like nothing else, although we do sometimes struggle to actually find a way to get it into a track. But once you start editing it, the, the way that it works with its performance controls, and especially certain things like velocity and aftertouch, it really does sound like nothing else, and it's almost completely unpredictable once you get going into it. Um, we know Hans Zimmer's completely obsessed with his and, and still uses it, and I think BT uh, has always said that he's been trying to get hold of one, and we were very lucky to find this one. Um, but we're just not sure how long it's going to stay here because, to be honest, it's a huge lump of capital sat in there that's uh, sitting there that's not really um, getting used an awful lot. I got a little bit obsessed with collecting various keyboards throughout the years, um, and unfortunately, they're all stacked together. They are quite carefully stacked together, even though it doesn't, may not look like it. Um, but from the back here, we've got a DX7 II, uh, sorry, DX7 Mark II, which does need a bit of work. Its batteries gone so it's gone a bit bonkers. Uh, Nordlead 3, one of our favourite kind of big sounding synths, even though at the time a few people didn't really seem to like it, we absolutely love it, it's a massive sounding thing once you get used to it. Um, TX81Z, a oh, little bit of dust in there, how thoroughly upsetting. One of our latest purchases was this, um, the K5000S, um, it's the one with all the extra sort of macro controls and things like that. It's an additive synth, but it makes some very, very, very unique sounds. And the great thing about some of these old synths is particularly the digital ones are kind of being overlooked. And there's enormous sound libraries for them, uh, or patch libraries online. Um, and this is one particularly that we're going to be using in the coming months. 
We've got an Andromeda A6 here, which uh, really shouldn't be relegated to a kind of standing up position, but we're very short on space at the moment. Now it's fully stuffed, it's got everything in there. Um, one of our massive favourites is the Roland V-Synth, something that was completely overlooked at the time, but once you get into um, the very phrase side of it, even though it's got a tiny 32 megabyte memory, which seems ridiculous now, um, it's really good fun and we do uh, an awful lot of special stuff on that. We've got a Juno 60 there at the moment. A friend of mine, Cass, has got the 6 and nestling behind there, which I'm not going to pull out now because this is all looking a little bit precarious, is an Oberheim Expander. Um, got a Nord GX2, a modular one that we absolutely um, still love, especially for certain FM things and various bits and pieces. A brilliant bargain basement. We found this for 50 quid up the road. It's a Casio, um, I think it's the VZ, isn't it? Yeah, the VZ1 um, that we sampled a couple of bases off because as everything kind of started to head back towards a slightly more retro sound, some of the things in here sound absolutely wonderful. Um, my Moog Voyager, which should have gone up for a kind of service just recently, only to get the, a new operating system on, but we've not actually managed to get it up. And there's a Korg Monopoly on there. Now, it looks ridiculous that we should have all of this stuff here, but we've been really lucky. And there is a little known thing in um, uh, business tax breaks in the UK at the moment, where they, when the recession hit, they wanted everyone to kind of reinvest. So there is a reinvestment allowance for you to be able to buy some stuff at a rate that you, uh, would affect your tax in a way that um, uh, may not ever be repeated again. So if anyone is looking to buy equipment, now is a really good time in the UK to do it. We do have um, quite some great stuff for people that are self-employed. Okay, so this is um, the kind of latest edition. We've got to find some room actually and stick it up because we tend to be um, using it an awful lot. Uh, the Profit 12, um, wonderful sounding thing. And hey, it's a profit, what more can you say? And when it actually turns on and everything goes bright red, it's uh, simply stunning. Um, wonderful sounding thing, completely modern sounding um, bit of equipment and has really made us think about some of the vintage stuff in here because this is much brighter and much more present than most uh, vintage synths where you have to work really hard with the vintage stuff to kind of get it uh, sounding good. And here's two perfect examples of what I mean with this. Um, the OBXA we've got in because we're doing some uh, kind of not disco is probably the wrong word to say but we're kind of heading back on a little bit of a retro tip and of course this sound this was the d-train synth and it was the one that was used on all the records that um are from that era and it sounds like nothing else when it gets going it's absolutely lovely it's a wonderful sounding thing great big warm fat thing and does all of those um just the way the architecture set up you can suddenly understand why certain records and certain sounds sounded the way that they did um, the only trouble is, as we say, we find you have to very, very, you have to spend quite a bit of time very, very carefully preamping it, EQing it, compressing it, and um, getting it ready to go in, and then quite a bit of post production as well. Whereas we find with the newer synth, like the Prophet, they just tend to fit a little bit more in the track. Um, underneath it is one that we kind of brought uh, as a little experiment because it came up just at the right price. It's a Roland JP4. Um, that's got a very weird MIDI board in it as well as a kind of retro fit uh, from Hungary. Um, and it allows for quite a lot of control, quite a lot of real time control. Um, we've got uh, MIDI controllers that will uh, affect the cutoff and all of that kind of thing. It is a bit of an odd beast and it does take quite a bit of tuning. So it, it can be considered a bit more of a classic car. This one, it's not kind of as instant. You've really got to look after it a bit. Um, it's not been tuned for a while, so uh, it could probably do with a good look at. This is obviously, needs no introduction, it's a Mini Moog, but it's not just any old Mini Moog. This Mini Moog was owned by the guy who um, built and dis or did the, um, the industrial design for the Oscar synth. Um, wonderful man that we've kind of kept in contact with, um, and he just wanted it to kind of go to a good home. We got it at a fairly decent price. Obviously, these things aren't cheap, but as I say, we saw... Uh, synths go up in the same way that classic guitars were in the 90s so some of these things we do actually consider investments and the great thing is we actually get to use these uh, as uh, as often as we can um, it's a wonderful example it sounds absolutely stunning it just takes a bit of a clean every now and again but to have it connected to uh, the guy who did the case design and the industrial design on the oscar means it seems to be even more poignant as uh, part of a bit of history a um, couple of other things, we've got a Jupiter JX10, which we're using for some of the 
uh, retro flavoured stuff that we've got going at the moment, uh, particularly a track with uh, Joel Edwards that we're working on where all the bass was done and that, and that's so much fun to get back to those kind of late 80s Super Jupiter big basses. Uh, Nor Piano, which is our main um, writing instrument if we're songwriting things like that. Got a Matrix 6 there, and this wonderful, wonderful machine that kind of doesn't really get uh, the kind of um, applause that it deserves. It's an Oberheim DPX-1, it's a sample player, but it will read Ensonic Mirage discs as well as Emulator 2 discs. Now you can't edit like you can on the Emulator 2 or the Mirage, but anyone who's used a Mirage knows how complicated that can be. But you will not believe the fun we had when we discovered we had the original uh, first disc that came with the Ensonic Mirage, which has got all of the main noises from uh, Big Fun. The ah, 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 oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, 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 and the strings from Strings of Life. They were all Ensonic Mirage discs. Um, but what's great about this, as I say, once again, it will read um, Emulator 2 discs. And some of the libraries are still coming up online. And we're just going through a process still of bunging them all into this and then actually sampling the patches so we've got a kind of archive. Um, it took us um, a while to kind of get into the thing because you're so used to big stereo sounds that everything that comes out of there is obviously mono, but it's got Curtis filters built in. It's a brilliant device and they're going very, very cheap. So if you do see them and you know anyone who's got an old um, uh, sample disc collection from either an emulator or um, an Ensonic Mirage, do grab it because it's great retro fun. A um, couple of other bits, Hona Pianet at the back there um, and an old TX7. So just stuff that we've found incredibly cheaply that we've had some fun with basically.